Ladies and gentlemen, back today we're going to be talking with somebody who's a professor of sociology and an author and uh, somebody who is very vocal on capitalism. We've got Professor Vivek Cheber. Cheber, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I always I always mess up everybody's names that come on here, so don't feel bad. That's okay. John Smith, I'll ruin it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. um, so you are author, journalist, academic, social theorist, editor, what, you're all kinds of things. What, what led you down this path in an academic sense? What made you get into left politics and stuff like that? It's really hard to say. You know, one can't, one can invent stories and um, kind of like biographical journeys of why you end up where you are, why your beliefs are what they are. But it's a combination of your upbringing. In my case, I was born into a very left-wing family. But then also the your own personality and your circumstances. Uh, so I was by the time I was in uh, college, my second or third year, I decided I was going to go into academia because it would allow me to pursue some of these questions that were of interest to me and uh, would not put me in a place in a position where I have to do harm to other people. So uh, I lucked out. I found a good place to do my PhD, and then I lucked out and got a decent job for myself and. I uh, lucked out and got tenure, so here I am. Do you think there's a certain amount of empathy that go is inherent with uh, leftist kind of politics? Empathy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's based on a sense that we're all in a common mission, and if somebody is being treated badly or is hurt anywhere around the world, it's uh, something that uh, that any decent-minded person should be offended by and should oppose. And I guess that the bottom of that is a kind of empathetic stance that um their suffering is something that uh also bothers us now how is that not inherent in all human beings though because it seems like we got some people on the other side of the aisle that are in, uh incapable of certain types of empathy empathy well, i wouldn't say that I, I think most people everywhere most everybody is capable of empathy uh, and exercise it the thing about empathy, though, is that you can't build a politics around it, nor can you build a, a practical stance around uh, towards the world around it. We are all capable of empathy. What makes a capitalist system unjust is that it forces us, many of us, to set aside our empathy, something that is very natural to us when we relate to other people because it puts our empathy in competition in competition against our desire to defend our material interests. So I might feel tremendous sympathy for you and empathy for you as a working person, but if it comes down to uh, acting on my empathy for you and beating you out for a job, I'm going to beat you out for a job. Mm -hmm. Now that's something where I can choose to just condemn myself, but it's better to condemn the choice set, the actual choices that I have where I'm forced to pit my interest against your well-being similarly if i am your employer i might sympathize with the fact that you need to make ends meet but i'm going to have to give you as low a wage as i can get away with and i might have to fire you even though I, even though i know that it means that you can't pay rent now i might feel that empathy but i'm going to have to suppress it otherwise i can't do my job the thing about capitalism is that it constantly consistently forces us to be immoral forces us to do things that in a perfect world we'd never do but we're forced to do because it's either that or we suffer a grievous harm to ourselves. So, yeah, everybody's capable of empathy. The people who are doing horrible things to others aren't necessarily lacking in that empathy. They just say that it has no place in the decisions that they make in the world that they inhabit. And they're right about that. Do you think the, the people that are the most successful in our society then are the ones that are able to switch that off the best or act in the most sociopathic and selfish at the drop of a hat? In many instances, there are lines of work where you can be quite successful by the standards of your occupation and not have to do evil things. I mean, academia is one, and that's why I chose it. I can be a very successful academic, publish lots and lots, but I don't have to screw people over in order to do it. Now, those are islands of decency in an otherwise barbaric culture. Most jobs, most occupations require that you set aside your basic moral intuitions. And that means that the people who are successful in those jobs, by the standards of those jobs, We'll have to engage in what you call, you know, correctly, sociopathic behavior.
Yeah. Are we manipulated, or let's say the people who are really driven by money and success and the, the, the frivolousness and the materialism of the modern world, are they uh, being manipulated into believing this, or do you think they really believe that they need the, the security that they're after? I mean, and, and to what end? Is, is there any end to what? Under a capitalistic society, it seems like these people have a bottomless pit of wants and needs. Well, manipulation is not the, the term I would use because it suggests that there's an active agent behind the scenes trying to get you to do what he or she wants you to do. What we are is our, um, our needs and desires are channeled in such a way that we end up leading meaningless lives or lives that are uh, uh, imposing harm onto others. That's not a imposition that particular individuals make. It's the basic structure, the basic choice set that a market a capitalist economy imposes on us. So basically, once you put a capitalist class structure in place, you can kind of sit back and watch people willingly and rationally imposing harm on others with full knowledge of what their circumstances are, which is the opposite of manipulation. Now, is that a meaning? Is that a bottomless pit? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It'll go on forever. It will destroy the planet mm. if, it, if we allow it to go on forever. There's no end in capitalism. There's never a point where you say, okay, the system has enough money. The system's got enough commodities. The system's making enough profits. It is a system in which you accumulate for the sake of accumulation, in which you make pro Now, why? Why do you do that? Nobody is saying, there's no philosophy that we all internalize that says, let's just accumulate. It's just that for any business to survive, it's got to maximize profits. In order to maximize profits, it's got to throw more and more goods onto the market. Those goods have to sell. So it now has to have advertising campaigns to make those goods appealing to people. People's needs are malleable. They will evolve over time. You didn't know you needed a smartphone 15 years ago. They didn't exist. Once they exist, you develop a need for it. It's not manipulation. It's just how human psychology works. Our needs evolve over time. But surely th there are... You have commodities for the sake of commodities is one that will never end. Yeah, and surely there are some products that are purely frivolous in nature and, and are, are heavily marketed to the point with manipulative advertising that say you need yeah. this thing when in fact they don't need these things at sure. all. But that's froth. That stuff that's floating up on top, uh, and you can easily point to needs being manipulated, but there's also genuine a creation of new needs and new desires that's also real. Yeah. And then, of course, there's our actual needs, which are going to always exist and which a economy is always going to nurture and fuel and in reality are very minimal probably compared to some of the stuff we dream that we need or yeah no uh, doubt yeah no doubt. but you know a life built around just those needs is an impoverished life so in any decent society you won't just make the goods that are absolutely necessary you will also make the goods that allow people to expand their abilities and expand their horizons which from a particular a certain narrow standpoint are you might call unnecessary goods they're unnecessary for survival but they're not unnecessary for human flourishing mm. those two kinds of goods we should distinguish from trivial goods pointless goods even harmful goods those of course in any decent society you do away with yeah and and human flourishing is one of these hot topics where it's subjective from person to person what what is considered human flourishing is yeah. is that, but we're at this eco, from an ecological standpoint there's also this a lot of talk about degrowth and stuff like that uh, and it kind of leads back to capitalism now what's what do you think how do we get around some of the ecological crises of that's being caused by capitalism well the first step is to add the, so there's varying gradation of corrections that we can make to the system we live in today and its destructive tendencies. If you have an unregulated capitalism that you leave to itself, it will absolutely destroy human civilization through the ecological channel, probably in a matter of a few generations, or at least so harm the, the uh, human civilization that it becomes unrecognizable from today's standards. At the very least, therefore, you have to move to a capitalism in which you change the incentive structure and the regulatory structure so that profit and the seeking of profit is forced to be in line with ecological limits. So there are certain products that you will lay off, that you will put off limits. There are certain kinds of inputs like fossil fuels, which you'll say we have to move away from. You might still have a capitalism, 
but one where inputs are no longer coming or energy is no longer coming through fossil fuels. Maybe we'll use wind and solar. Maybe we'll use nuclear. It'll still be capitalism, but now it's one where you're consciously engineering what's available as an input and energy, what is not. My own view is that even that will not be enough because you're still having this unceasing, unquenchable production of endless goods, endless commodities. So you have to, in, to some degree, scale back this unquenchable thirst for goods. That will not happen as long as you're in capitalism, even a regulated capitalism. So I think we, the next step is to move beyond a social democratic or regulated capitalism to something like a market socialism. In a market socialism, you still have markets, you'll still have some competition, but you have the room available for people who are working in plants, who are working in hotels or factories to not blindly pursue and put profits above everything else, but weigh the importance of profits against their free time, against their health, against other things which are routinely sacrificed in a capitalist plant. Mm. And then if you can go beyond that to a more planned economy, that will probably be ideal for the, uh, for the environment. I just don't think that's possible. I don't think a fully planned economy is really something we can ever achieve. What I do know is that we can go beyond an unregulated capitalism that we have right now. We can definitely go towards a pretty advanced form of a welfare state and social democracy, and we might be able to achieve something like a market socialism. Yeah, and I think when you talk about uh, the ecological kind of crisis that we're in, there's no way that we can preach uh, consumption reduction because it's in the bylaws of capitalism that we continuously have to, you know, consume, 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 because that creates the excess that a government can spend and but w whatever. So I think I agree with you in the sense that it's not going to work, right? For that you, you cannot have a capitalism in which there's a blind pursuit of profit where you also have a uh, uh, concern for the environment. At, at the very minimum, it has to be a regulated capitalism. So, and that brings me to my, you know, I've been in contact with what they call libertarians or some form of accelerationists. I don't know what you'd like to call them, but people who think that the government is the problem. What would you say to a libertarian that's trying to pin, uh, pin all the problems of society on just government? It has zero empirical basis. Absolutely zero. They live in a fantasy world. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, that's why the, the philosophy gets nowhere. It's, it's, you see it among 18-year-old boys and some people in frat parties or sorority parties or you see it in philosophical institutes that are funded by billionaires, but it has zero, it has very little traction among professional philosophers, and it has absolutely no political traction in the electoral arena, because libertarianism, the foundations of libertarianism are a fantasy world. Mm. You can, if you really think that the only evil in society is government and that the economy is a bastion of freedom, you haven't worked a day in your life. I mean, you don't, you've never experienced the arbitrary power that your boss has over you you've never experienced the unfreedom of somebody saying to you accept this job or starve you've never experienced all the costs that are associated with losing a job and having to spend six eight ten months finding a new job while your employer if he lost his factory tomorrow could basically never have to work a day in his life ever again because he has assets worth millions and millions yeah. now here's the thing about libertarianism the dirty little secret what we call libertarianism, its view of the market originated in the 18th century with people like Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. If you read The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith is absolutely clear that the market is not a bastion of freedom. It is one in which you have the tyranny of the employers over their employees. This fiction of the freedom of the market is a 20th century fiction that 20th century libertarians invented because by now they had to deal with a socialist movement and a working class movement that was pointing to these evils. And it was because of the Cold War that libertarianism had to reinvent itself as an arm of American diplomacy and of the domestic state where it had to erase what it had always acknowledged, which is that markets are not a markets are better than serfdom. They're better than slavery. They're better than what you had in the medieval world. A little bit. But if you're actually describing them, and they're the degree of freedom that they have, they are absolutely rife with power imbalances. And every so-called liberal economist 
up until the 1940s and 50s knew this, didn't hide it. So and people like Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell come along later and, and start making these wild, um, you know, uh, assumptions about human nature. What are some of the misconceptions that these kind of people make about human nature when it comes to... Well, I don't to think the problem there is with human nature per se. They have, I would say, an unduly narrow conception of human nature. But their basic conception is two things. One is that human beings covet liberty, that liberty is the most dearly held value that humans have. And the second one is that human beings exercise their liberty through maximizing their utility, maximizing their gains from market transactions. Now, I don't have any problem with the fact that human beings hold liberty to be dear. One of the reasons I'm opposed to capitalism is that I think it squelches liberty. It squelches people's freedom. It imposes arbitrary authority on people. Where I do think they're mistaken is in their view that human beings are basically selfish bastards. Yeah. Now, the, the way to correct that is not to say human beings are actually altruists or that there's no human nature at all. To, both of these are common uh, strategies amongst people who call themselves leftists. That's a mistake. Every human being has a very healthy sense of their material interests. Every human being wants to protect their well-being and their welfare. But you can be somebody who is um, def defending their material well-being without necessarily constantly wanting to screw over the other person. The basic, what anthropologists have sort of settled upon as a description of human nature is that you people are what's called reciprocal altruists, which means I'm willing to do the right thing. I'm not always going to be a selfish bastard. I'm willing to do the right thing as long as I'm not treated like a sucker, as long as people don't consistently take advantage of me. Now, that's an incredibly valuable discovery about human beings because it means that if you give me a chance to be decent towards other people, I will be. It'll make me happy. But what does that mean? Don't put me in a situation where it's me or them. Now you're asking me to be an altruist. I can't be an altruist. If it's me versus them, I'm going to have to do what I have to do to protect myself. But if you put me in a situation where we can cooperate, I'm not going to look to screw other people over. I'll be happy to cooperate with them as long as I feel that they will be decent to me. That's reciprocal altruism. Interesting. So there is a human nature. It's not altruistic. It is self-regarding, but it's not self-aggrandizing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, just some some people are just selfish. I, I don't. I can't really explain other than that. You know, it's like uh, some we are psychotic. Some people are, that doesn't matter. You it's a spectrum. Find, yeah, but the key is what's the modal description of a human being? What is the most common orientation that people have? You build your social theories based on that, not on the exceptions, not the outliers, not the weirdos. Yeah, I, it's it's just that they always bring up terms like they they bring up a. Uh, uh, you know, evolution and stuff and saying uh, survival of the fittest, but, uh, you know, Darwin also... Evolution doesn't show that. Yeah, but yeah. evolution is actually an inter interweaved, uh, you know, symbiotic, you know, organisms. But fittest means fittest to reproduce. Right. Not strongest and nastiest. It's fittest <laughs> to reproduce. And there's actually a great deal of anthropological evidence and a great deal of work in evolutionary biology that shows that what enabled human beings be to be the fittest to reproduce was reciprocal altruism was this because why they're moving around in small bands if everybody in that small band is trying to screw over the other person the species would have been eliminated because of the weakest species physically the only way human beings survived was through cooperation mm -hmm. they have an innate ability and instinct to cooperate as mm -hmm. long as the cooperation doesn't come at the expense of individual well-being so the one other way in which libertarians are completely off their rockers <laughs> and out of touch with reality is that they have these bogus evolutionary arguments. And this is just middle school level philosophy. It has no connection to actual research that's going on in either the natural or the social sciences. If I had a nickel for every, every gun nut with a yellow hat on and a big long beard who wanted to tell me uh, what's good, <laughs> what's better than socialism. Um, so let's get on to your books look you've written a lot of books and i just wanted to go over some of the stuff because they're each amazing in their own right and they go into some pretty uh fascinating aspects look locked in place state building and late industrialization in india okay that was in 2003 correct yes um this book examines process of state building industrialization in india so can take take me through this book what is it about and what made you want to write it 
Well, it's a book that's examining the ability of governments to steer economic development. There has never been a, a story of successful economic growth in, in which government didn't play a very active role. From the rise of the modern economy in England and Holland, all the way through to co the contemporary world, there has never been not one example of a successful free market growth, never. So what the only thing that we've seen is variability in the ability of governments to steer growth. But wherever there's been successful growth, governments played a, have played a crucial role. Mm. This is especially the case with what's called late developing societies, countries that were poor going, coming into the 20th century and which tried to catch up with the West in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Two such countries were Korea, South Korea, and India. Both of them had a very, very heavy involvement of the state. What I try to do in that book is to explain why some countries like Korea had a very successful state-led development and countries like India where the state managed moderate levels of success in hot housing and steering an industrialization process, but not as, as successful as Korea. So mm. it's trying to explain that. It's kind of an inside baseball debate uh, in, in, among economists about the role of the government. Uh, but it, the big picture story of that is that the neoliberal myth that uh, if you want successful growth, get the government out of the market is a total myth and a lie. Uh, successful growth has relied on pervasive government interventions in the market. And I was just trying to examine how what it na enables them to do so successfully you're successfully talking me down from the kind of insanity conversations i have every day on the internet with you know yahoos of all kinds um okay. so how does that reflect to what kind of what china's doing now as far as this mix of capitalism and and um, communism or whatever that you want to call it yeah i mean china is one uh, shining example or not one i'd want to follow because it has a very authoritarian government and does some pretty horrible things but strictly on the issue of what enables successful industrialization china is an example of the state very carefully managing a balance of taking the best from markets but also steering investment and managing investment into the sectors that it deems to be the most important ones china from say 49 to 78, 79 was kind of a Soviet style centralized planned economy. And from the 90s onward, has oriented more and more towards the market, but never the free market. It's been very much state directed market development. So China is what you would call a mixed economy of some kind. I would call it kind of a state capitalism, where you have basically lots of space given to markets to decide where investment is going to flow, but that space is tightly hemmed in and controlled by the state. So it's an example, it's a, another, yet another uh, hole in the, uh, in the story that neoliberals like to propound of what we need for successful growth. Now, I wonder what they decide to do from uh, what the state decides to do from an industrialist standpoint. Is it democratic there or is it more authoritarian? No, they'll never give up the authoritarianism. Yeah, not, we, not we know what's good for you. Just, you know. Yeah, look, the people who are in the Communist Party, who are in the highest echelons of the state, they live like kings. Why would they ever give that up? <laughs> It'll have to be taken from. Them. Yeah, all, all uh, for me, it's like all. Uh, all attempts to organize society are just fail miserably. But um, I, I want to ask you about po post-colonial theory and the specter of capital. This was a big, huge book for you. you uh, you're talking about uh, criticizing po post-colonial theory. I love this because it really was talking about what we talked about earlier, which is you can't really have... You can't say you're post-colonial if you're still capitalistic. Is that right? Uh, no, those two uh, have nothing to do with each other. Post-colonial, the word post-colonial is used in two ways in academia. One is the commonsensical way, which is after colonialism. Post-colonialism means after colonialism. So there's huge chunks of the world that are post-colonial in the sense that they were once colonized, once under the thumb of some European power, and then they achieved freedom. They became post-colonial or independent states. Mm. Okay. Post-colonial theory is something very different. 
Postcolonial theory refers to a particular approach to understanding these societies. So it's a theory as opposed to the reality of being an independent country. So this theory says, how do we understand these countries that came out of colonialism? And my book was a critique of a lot of these theories. So one way to understand these theories is that they were kind of the one, uh, uh, one form that identity politics has taken in the contemporary world. The essence of post-colonial theory was to say, if you want to understand a country like India or Nigeria or any uh, sub-Saharan uh, African country or the Arab world, which was under British or French influence, um, you can't use Western theories. You can't use, say, a liberal theory or Marxist theory or even libertarianism because these all came out of the West. You have to use theories coming out of the, these countries themselves. And why? Because brown people, black people don't think like white people. All right. So then I, so my. Sounds kind of uh, racist, man. It's racist to the core. <laughs> now, the only difference is it's black and brown people saying this. So because it was black and brown people saying this, it got a lot of currency. It got currency, not because people actually believe, nobody believes this. Yeah. It got currency because black and brown people were able to make careers out of this sure. and move up the academy. Um, and liberals put up with it because liberals had their own version of identity politics, whether it was around gender, whether it was around race within the United States. Mm. So it was appealing to people from, say, India. By people, I mean academics who were looking for jobs. It was appealing to African ori uh, origin academics because now, if I tell you as a white person, you'll never understand India because you're from here. The next step is for you to say to me, then will you explain it to me, please, since you're brown? And I say, sure, just give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> you give me a job in the academy and I'll be your native informant. And this became the philosophy of upwardly mobile black and brown people, which they used to gain a foothold in a highly competitive academic job market. Yeah. But in so doing, I don't know, nah, I don't care about that. I don't care what academics are doing They're It's a fairly corrupt uh, culture, but they're propagating ideas that are extremely destructive. And they're essentially tribal ideas in which you have different races and different cultures and they can't speak to each other or ever understand each other. That only white supremacists have ever said that until now. And now you've got people who say they're progressive or say they're anti-racist and who are saying a white person can never, never understand what's going on in India. This is just really pernicious ideas. Yeah. Um, so, and to, for me, what was really wor the worst of it was they were saying, you know, socialism and Marxism because their European ideologies are also racist ideologies. And that's mm. just, this is absurd. Nobody has fought against racism the way socialists did across the 19th and 20th centuries, whether they were white socialists or black or brown socialists. Mm. So I wrote the book criticizing it and calling it out as a racist ideology. And that's why it stirred up a lot of debate. And this is also, you know, uh, once again, denying our most basic biological facts that we are all the same yeah. animal, right? And we all have certain basic needs and we all have certain basic uh, things we hold to be horrible, like authoritarianism and a lack of democracy. And we all need a decent life and a decent job and health care, whether mm -hmm. we're black, brown or white. Um, these are important points to, to defend. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank God that Marxism, socialism, all these ideas are getting more popular uh, as we move on into late stage capitalism. So maybe okay. we'll see a we'll see a turn of the tide. A lot of young people out there, I have hope, a little bit. Yeah, Just, sure. not a lot, but a little. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, all right. One last question: uh, the class matrix, social theory after the cultural turn. So I'm assuming this is about uh we're losing the battle of actual workers rights to culture war kind of stuff is that right that's right that's right that's exactly right i wrote two books one is the class matrix which is making the more taking on some of the more arcane academic and philosophical uh arguments around the culture wars and the other is called confronting capitalism which is a more popular book making the same sorts of points that i do in the class matrix but that's geared at organizers at high school students at some anybody off the street who wants to understand how uh, the world around them works and how uh, in the past we've been able to change it 
bend it towards more just and more humane outcomes. Both books are trying to do the same thing. Mm. Good. Yeah, because we see it every day, all day, every day, that um, we're losing grasp on what's really important in a political discourse. So uh, we'll wrap it up there. I want to thank you for coming on. You're a wonderful human being. I'm going to say your name again. Let's, just, let's see how it goes. Ready? Professor Vivek Chibur. There you go. Not bad, huh? Hey, practice makes perfect. And even though you're white. Yeah. I am. I am the. I have the self-hating Westerners complex, bro. Uh, hard. Yeah. Uh, there's hope for you yet, Chris. All right. Well, I appreciate it. We'll sign off to everybody. Let's talk uh, briefly after. Thanks for coming, everybody. See you next time. Thanks for having me.